All right, hello, welcome everybody. I am James Orr, and tonight we're doing how to acquire a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio, starting with just $3,000. Upcoming classes, while well, we have last minute people coming in. Uh, so next week, the 24th of April, uh, Brian is gonna be teaching, not sure it's funny yet. Uh, Brian is gonna be teaching uh, creating wealth. Oh, is that, yeah, I don't know what's going on back there. Um, so what's that one going to be about, Brian? Can we get the mic for Brian? Thank you. I do not want to throw the mic. No. Uh, that class is about uh, Robert Allen's book, Creating Wealth. Uh, he buys 20 houses and then across 10 years and sells 10 of them to pay off the other 10. and. So we'll discuss whether or not that actually works and what the math looks like and how you could do it in this market. Um, and then some other just kind of basic financial principles. Cool. Anyone come to the uh, fire class, the one where everyone's yelling fire in the room? Yeah, everyone remember that? Anyone not at that class? Okay, so those people that were at that class, um, you remember Brian and Royce kept asking me, what about using equity in the properties to kind of be able to retire earlier? And uh, the Creating Wealth book is about that. So basically using the equity you have in the properties you already own to perhaps sell some of those and pay off some of the earlier ones you own in order to hit your financial independence number earlier. And I ended up doing the, uh, that math for you as part of the FIRE presentation, as part of the new book. It's the last chapter. It's basically about uh, using equity in those in order to do that. So Brian will be teaching that, uh, but it also there's a new chapter. There's a chapter in the new book for that presentation as well. So. And then after that, the world's greatest deal analysis spreadsheet unleashed. That is May 1st. Brian, what, that, what is that one going to be about? Why are you looking at me like that? Uh, that is about the spreadsheet that is available on your website that I built. And there's a couple other pieces in there from Brendan. I don't know if Brendan's here. No, nope, it's not here. Um, and so we will walk through how to use that, how to analyze deals. Uh, we might do some live deal analysis. Uh, so. If you don't know how to analyze deals or you want to know how to analyze deals, that is a class to attend. Yeah, just a quick poll. How many people want to learn how to analyze deals? Raise your hands, please. Is there anyone who does not need to know how to analyze deals? Besides Brian and I. Okay. All right, cool. That's interesting. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be a good class. So uh, the week after that is May 8th. I will not be here. Brian will be teaching how to get your first deal done. Um, I will tell you what that class is. It's basically Brian trying to teach every single NCRAG class in one night. It's so, amazing. It is amazing, but it is you trying to teach every single class in one night. Okay, what is that one about? It's literally just step by step how to get your first deal done in two hours. Yeah. Like we're not going ten hours or three weeks of class. It's just a two hour class. Right. You try to like just talk really fast and do all of it. And that is what you do with three hundred charts. Yeah. You'll like tonight's presentation. I, I shortened it. It used to be one hundred and thirty slides. It is not that anymore. So the rule of thumb for number of slides in a presentation is like one every five minutes, just so you know. So how many slides should I have tonight? 24. Oh, that's not good. Tops. That is not going to be good. Okay. Uh, so NCRAG anniversary spectacular. So May 15th. Um, did anyone show up for the party last week? I totally did. You did? And Brian did? Yeah. So that was Brian's birthday party. It got canceled because of snow. So I don't have to be a year older. Ha! <laughs> that may be true. So he's going to be he's going to have his 50th again next year. So uh, we're going to have a replacement party. What? The fact that everyone is laughing tells you that everyone knows you're 50 and I'm only 40. I am going on 50 a couple years. Um, so this is going to be NCRAG Anniversary Spectacular, May 15th. Uh, so NCRAG was started in 2003. So this will be our 16th year anniversary. And we'll celebrate Brian's birthday on that date as well. Don't so, be fooled. This is actually James's birthday party. This is not James's birthday party. James's birthday party is not that date. James's birthday party. Uh, and then someone thinks I have a typo. This class coming up on May 29th is how to acquire a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio while earning $5,000 a month, which is very different than tonight's class, which is how to acquire a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio starting with $3,000. So uh, one of them you... You actually earn the money and you save up until you have enough money to buy the properties. This other one, you just start buying and you use the money from lease options. So we'll talk about that tonight. So they're very different classes. That's going to be on May 29th. Any questions on upcoming classes? Sweet. 
Uh, introductions, who are you? And then what class would you most like to see taught next live? And then please do not take photos of slides or record audio or video of incorrect presentations. Some of the recordings are available on James Orr and the podcast. So, no, there's a slide for it. Thank you. So, uh, who are you? What class would you like to see taught next live? Um, my name's Austin, and I would like to see Royce teach a class of his choice. Yeah, Royce is going to be teaching a class. He's, we've been talking about that. Hi, I'm Michelle. Seller presentation. Yeah, seller presentation. Brian's going to teach that. I think we've got it coming up in the fall. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I'm not teaching that one. Uh, hello, I'm Nick. Um, I honestly want to see the creating well. Um, I've read the book, and I would like to see the math behind a lot of the stuff. Yeah, yeah. Did you? When did you? When did you read the book? When did you read it? Oh, okay. Very cool. Yeah, you'll like it. It's a good class. Uh, my name is Sean. Uh, I'm in the class that I wanted to see. This is the class. Woo! April Panero, and I'm um, looking forward to that, creating your wealth. So I'm hoping my schedule will open up. Okay, awesome. Thank but you. This class, of course. This class is good too. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you don't have to say this class. My ego is big enough already. You don't have to stroke it for class. But uh, yeah, let's just see how it goes. <laughs> hey, I'm Mitchell, and I want to see that create, create wealth. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Wow. That's a popular class. <laughs> uh, who, who knew is true? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would have never guessed that one, and especially since it's like a 30-year-old book at this point. It's like from the 80s. So, yeah. My name's Greg. Interested in possibly funding stuff, get finding funding, money. So, like private money, yep. hard money, or traditional private, financing? Private, private money. Private money. Okay. Um, I do have a class on that. I haven't taught it in years. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I will bring that one back out of retirement or not. So, but I've got a whole bunch of materials on raising money. So. Awesome. Hey, uh, my name's Brian, and uh, besides asset protection and seller presentations, any, <laughs> anything you guys teach is awesome. All right, I appreciate that. Thank you. I know, really. <laughs> you just feel comfortable saying seller presentations. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I'm Brian Williams, long-term buy and hold investor in Northern Colorado. Um, I don't know. I don't need to answer this question. You don't need to answer this question? No. Okay. There's no classes you want to see taught by me? Class. Despite the, the calendar suggests otherwise, there's like two classes up there for me. There's one up there. What, what yeah. are you talking about? James and James. Yeah, I'm definitely taking the summer off. Yeah. All right. I'm Laura. Hi. Every class is amazing. So every class is I amazing? I appreciate everyone. <laughs> okay. Learn something every time. Awesome. I'm Al. Uh, maybe creative financing, uh, things that are kind of out of the ordinary. Creative financing, like subject to and lease option and installment land contract yeah, and yeah. agreement for Seller deed. Finance, and all the yeah. uh, HELOCs, stuff like that. Oh, HELOCs. That's actually I mean, not just all the different things that normally you don't look okay. into. Thanks. We do have a recording of that class. It's, it's unlikely I will teach that one again live, but we do have a good recording of it. Yeah. I'm Grace, and Hi. I don't have anything specific. I just awesome. like learning. I'm Lance. I want to learn uh, multi-property, multifamily. Okay, like the deal analysis multifamily? Okay. Are you doing that one? Okay. I'm Kevin, and uh, I was thinking something with seller financing for to piggyback on Al's. Seller financing? financing like owner care? The challenge with seller financing in our market right now is they're highly unusual. So, no, they exist. It's just really, really unusual. We occasionally see them even in the MLS, and the terms for them tend to be not great. Occasionally, you'll find one that's reasonable, but they tend not to be amazing, um, and they tend to be really infrequent. So. It's like it's hard to teach a class when maybe two people will end up using it over the course of a year. So I'm Barbie and I love Mary. Okay, the interview? Yeah. Do the mic though. Oh sorry. Yeah. Mary. And then <laughs> I like uh, the um, asset protection. Okay. And I'm looking forward to the deal analysis. Deal analysis, sure. Um, so I'll stop there. Okay, awesome. We do have another interview coming up. We do have at least one new interview coming up. I'm Bob, and I heard a lot about the class where you design your own spreadsheet. Yes. And maybe we could bring that one back. Yes, this sounds like a really good idea. We should do another class where we design a spreadsheet. Maybe right after we teach deal analysis. You're the entrance exam. <laughs> on like using Excel? And the one on compounding interest, I think. Oh my gosh, that, that actually will never come back. That is the worst class ever. Yeah. That really is like the worst class, worst class ever. 
I don't even know if we have a recording of that, but if there is, it should be deleted. Yeah. Hello. Hey, my name's Grayson, and I'm pretty interested in a lot of the ones that are on the agenda right away, but uh, you check the deal there, analysis please? mainly. Yeah, okay. Looking forward to that. Awesome, thanks. Which one was it? The deal analysis. Okay, awesome, cool. I'm Mac, and I'd like to see the asset protection. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I am Laura, and anything to do with lease options, subject to anything in that realm. Okay. My name is Peter, and same thing, subject to um, lease options. Okay. Like My name is Tom Ditto. Okay. So uh, for those of you that want subject to and lease option uh, and the creative finance stuff, there was one summer, it wasn't last year, it was probably 2017, where I taught like 10 classes in a row, and I went over everything related to um, how to do the marketing in order to find off-market deals, how to do your whole business planning for doing off-market deals, how to go structure all the creative financing type deals, um, sell our presentations, that was when I last did that class. So there's like a whole series of them and they're all recorded and on the website. The chance of me doing those again is almost zero. So, um, but we do regular lease option stuff like selling on lease option, but we do not do buying on lease option or buying subject to, and we definitely do not recommend selling subject to. So um, there's a whole bunch of classes already on the podcast and on the website for those, and my the chance of me doing them again live is really really low. So just I would go there if I were if I were you guys looking for those. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Dan. Um, I'm Don, uh, long term investor. I'm also a uh, money partner. Um, deal analysis, love deal analysis. Okay. We'll do more of this. I'm Bob. I'm late to the game. I want to get caught up. And okay. I'm going, how? How to get caught up? Yeah. So we have a class on that. It's called Catch Up Nomad. We'll talk about that. Tonight's class will be good for you, too. Um, Jennifer, and um, I don't know. You've covered, like, everything. Maybe, like, crazy financing, like tax liens and stuff like that. Okay. It's I don't not think usually, you've covered that it's yet. It's not a financing, but tax liens is a strategy we could do. I actually have done tax liens. Yeah, I actually, I wrote a book on tax liens. It's actually one of my first books I ever wrote. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, my name's Doug, and uh, I guess creative financing would be what I'm most interested in. Like subject to and lease option and owner financing and things like that? Anything you can give me in that area. Absolutely. Okay. So did you hear me tell him that probably not teaching it live, but there are recordings? Uh, I heard the recordings. I didn't get where. So they're on the website or the podcast? That's James Orr. Yep, jamesor.com. Yep. Hi, I'm Wes. Uh, I guess I'd be interested in newbie stuff, the dangers and risks, maybe. Play the cash flow game. Okay. So there is a <laughs> separate know. class on dangers and risks of real estate investing. Uh, I probably will not teach that live again either, but it is, uh, it is recorded, um, and it's good. And then beginning stuff, he's got a class coming up. Yeah, getting your first deal done. Yeah, that's going to be good. That'll be a really good first class for you. So awesome. Hi, I'm Jordan, and like him, I'm here to learn. Anything okay. and everything. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Welcome. Uh-oh. What do you want, Tambo? I'm, uh, I'm Tammy Orr, real estate broker. work with James. James also happens to be my husband. That's true. And uh, ownership is signed. Um, <laughs> um, and too bad Royce isn't here tonight, but I think I'd like to see Royce teach like a double header asset protection and seller presentation. That'd be really strong. <laughs> yeah. You should just be. put that on the calendar and tell them. That's crazy. Do we miss anybody? <laughs> miss you. And while we're waiting for the mic get over there, did anyone not get a copy of the rental application re evaluation criteria sheet from a couple of weeks ago? Anyone not get a copy of this? Anyone else? Going once. Anyone else? Going twice. I'll get to you. We'll do your introduction in a second, Alex. No Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Brian says, have your attorney review it. Hello. Thank you. You're welcome. There's two there. Anyone else? OK. Yeah, go listen to the recording of that class and use that. Alex, you want to introduce yourself? Who are you and what class would you like to see taught next slide? Um, I'm Alex. I would love to see anything about creative financing as well. Um, and then anything about also about asset protection I'm really interested in. Okay. Well. Awesome. Thank you. Do we miss anyone else? Oh, Anita. Where's the mic runner? <laughs> Thank you. So, Anita, who are you? What class would you like to see taught next live? 
Okay. I'm Anita Coddington. I um, am just starting out here. I don't know which class I'd like to see, but I'm going to be looking at funding here soon. I'm going to need some funding. Okay. We have a whole class on financing, so you probably should go do that. I'll hold the mic, please. Okay. So uh, for those of you that don't know, we have a podcast, and there's like 130 or 140 classes um, all recorded on the podcast already. So you should go there and do that. If you need the link other than the Apple one, this is for the iTunes, podcast.incraig.com. That'll take you directly to the podcast link. Uh, see the email from Holly. So it's usually in the bottom of the email. It gives you links to like Stitcher and Spotify and things like that. So uh, if you missed that, just look for the email at Holly for those. And then there's actually two new podcasts coming on. Uh, one of them is for, they're actually both related to real estate financial planners. So I'll say that for now, and I'll go and cover other things about it when we actually physically launch them. Any questions on podcast? Awesome. So, congratulations to everybody. We reached 1,200 NCRAG members last week. So, thank you all for continuing to come and continuing to refer people and do that. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, as a token of our gratitude for the community we've kind of put together here, we have provided cookies and um, diabetes juice. So, and. What? Isn't that what it is, diabetes juice? <laughs> so uh, please do have yourself uh, some cookies. And in case you didn't get enough sugar, there is some soda next to it. So uh, feel free to get up and grab some right now if you want to or later. Um, so whatever you guys need to do. Thank you very much for doing that. And uh, I'm not taking any of those home, so please take more than one. All right, so how to acquire a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio with just $3,000. So then versus now. So this is not the first time I've taught this class. Um, I taught this class, let me think about this, probably was two, almost two years ago now. Um, and there are previous versions of the class. And I wrote a book on it. So how many people came to the Christmas party? Not last year, not the year before, but I believe the year before that. So what was that? 18, 17, 16. How many people came to the Christmas party in 2016? If you came to the Christmas party in 2016, you received this book as a gift. It had a different cover at the time. It had like a little piano looking shape with houses on it. That was the number of houses you bought by year. But that was this book. And so tonight, depending on uh, who participates the most, you will get copies of the book. Um, but the, the book itself goes into a ton more detail than I am tonight. And the last time I taught this presentation, I literally had like 140 slides, a lot of them charts. I've cut it down to 60. And I plan on telling more story tonight, going a little bit slower than I have historically. But there is a recording of the last time I taught it in excruciating detail, the 130 slide version. So if you are really serious about implementing this model, I would encourage you to go listen to that recording. And I would encourage you to read the book. Because they might have, they have a lot of overlapping stuff, but there's going to be some slight differences between them. Okay? So, um, also in the book and in the previous recording, there were different assumptions. The reason I wrote the, rewrote the class today and yesterday is because the previous time I was teaching this, the property I was using was a $286,000 property based on a new construction property that you could buy then in, in Windsor or Greeley, and now you cannot find that particular property anymore. Okay? The market's gone up. And so I changed it, so now we're talking about a $350,000 property, which you can buy in today's market, new construction. So the numbers have all been adjusted. Uh, so there's dozens of additional charts and more detail about the math. There's more story, less charts tonight. And if you want all the detail, if you think you just got ripped off, oh, I thought I was coming for like the 130 charts James normally goes over in this class. The good news is, because I rewrote the class using the new financial calculator, the Real Estate Financial Planner calculator, you can copy the exact scenario we're covering tonight into your own account and change any of the assumptions. So if you say to me, hey, I don't want to do $350,000 houses, I want to do 340, or I want to do 360, or I'm not able to get the interest rate James is talking about, I want to use a different one, or I have a different income, or I'm starting with more than three grand, or any other changes to the assumptions you want to make, just copy this URL, this would be a good time for you to write it down, copy this URL, and then you'll be able to go and actually just copy it right into your account and change the assumptions, okay? So that's why I felt justified I felt comfortable removing 60 of the slides because you have access to them all. It's not just the only place you can get them is here. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Any questions on then versus now? Sweet. So what is plain vanilla nomad? I'm going to start off with the basics. How many people, this is your first time here ever? Okay, if you have not handed in your form, I would encourage you to hop up and do that before we run out of Nomad books. So fill out your form sooner than later. Go bring them over to Allison. Allison will give you a copy of the Nomad book, which is different than this book. And she will give you a copy of the book so that you have it. Um, and it goes over all the different types of Nomad in that book. So if you've never been here before though, I wanna show you what Nomad is. All right, so Nomad is you buy a home as an owner occupant. This is not buying a home as an investor. This is moving into the property. You buy a home as an owner occupant. You live there for a year. Why do we live there for a year? Is a requirement of the lenders, not necessarily FHA. It could be conventional financing, it could be USDA, it could be VA, but it is an owner occupant loan, which when you get the loan requires you, the lender's gonna require that you sign something that says, I agree to live in this property for at least a year. You get a better interest rate, you can do lower down payment, okay? So you live there for a year. Then you buy a new home, you convert the previous one to a rental, so you do not sell the previous house, you make that a rental, you move into a new house, and then you repeat this process until you have as many houses as you want to acquire, whether that's one or 20 or 50 or whatever it is, okay? That's what Nomad is, and there's a whole book on it you'll get if, you've, if you give your, your forms, okay? Uh, let's see, so this was the traditional Nomad I just covered. Tonight is different. The strategy for tonight is Nomad with lease option. And there's a lot of similarities, but they're slightly different. So you're gonna buy a home as an owner-occupant, that's the same. You're gonna live there for a year, that's the same. You're gonna buy a new home, that's the same. But instead of renting it out, you're now gonna put a tenant buyer, someone who's going to lease the property from you, but desires to purchase it from you in the next year or two years or three years. You're gonna put a tenant buyer in the property and you're gonna lease option the property to them, okay? Then we're gonna replace any sold properties with new properties as you go, and you're gonna repeat this process until you reach your financial goals. So this is like the same thing as traditional Nomad, but this is lease option. So these are the steps that are different, okay? Any questions on the difference here? We're gonna go over a lot of this tonight, so you'll see it quite a bit. Any questions? Sweet. If it gets too hot in here, we'll try to like do something with the door. The light on is muted. Okay. What's the advantage and disadvantage between the two ideas? So the advantage of doing traditional Nomad is you own the properties. The advantage of this one is you get an option fee up front. The tenant buyer tends to take a little bit better care of the property historically because they have an ownership mentality and they're eventually gonna buy it from you. So a downside is they're gonna take the property from you. You're not gonna have the asset anymore. You're gonna have to go buy another one to replace it. But one of the things we're gonna do is when, when a tenant buyer comes in and they want to lease option a property from you, most of the time they're going to give you an option fee. Money up front to give them the rights to buy it from you at some pre-agreed upon price. And we're going to use that option as a down payment to buy our next property. So we're going to be able to use that to fund down payments for future purchases. And that's one of the tricks we're going to use tonight in order to acquire a whole bunch of properties with very little money up front. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So who is this for? We're gonna just quickly go over the seven types of nomads so you know who this is for. So catch up nomad, these are people that buy a house, move in, live there for a year, convert the previous one to a rental when they buy their next one and repeat the cycle for people that are catching up for retirement. You wake up one morning, you're 45 years old, you're 55 years old, you realize, holy crap, I don't have what I need in order to save up for retirement done. I need to get caught up. That's what this strategy is about. So all the classes on catch up nomad, if that's you, you wanna go watch those classes. The next one is young nomads. Uh, someone who just graduated from college, they got a professional job, they want to go and um, you know, start acquiring properties early, that's Young Nomads. The stuff we cover in Young Nomads are things like getting roommates, house hacking, things of that nature. Little Down Nomads, people that watch late night TV and they want to get interested in investing in real estate and they have very little to put down. Little Down Nomads. College Nomads, if you're saving for college, like let's say you're saving for college for your kids, or you just got out of college and you have college debt, this college nomad goes over different ways to pay off college or save for college using that strategy. Legacy nomads, so um, the legacy nomad is me, basically my sons, they um, they're just entered the workforce, we're gonna move some money from our assets to pay down payments for them, move money out of our state to help them do it, and so we will help them with down payments to do this. So legacy nomad is, 
when you actually help other people do the nomad model. And if it's you who's the young person, maybe it's your grandparents helping you with small down payments to do it. Flush Nomad, this is when you have enough money where you do not need to move in. You put 20% down, so it's another way of doing sequential buying, where you're putting 20% down instead of having to do moving into the property, you could just do non-owner occupant loans. And then Creative Nomads are people that are buying properties like Subject To or Lease Options, where you do not need to move into the property, you can do it creatively. It's really hard to do this in our market right now. That may change in the future, but right now it's really difficult. Okay? All right. So for those of you who are like, I've already got a plan. I've got my 401k, I've got my self-directed IRA, I've got my IRA at work, I've got some pension, I've got you know, my regular plan to go buy a whole bunch of rental properties. There's a famous saying by the US Navy SEALs. And the saying is, let me hope I get this right. It is, one is no, two is one and one is none. And the idea is that if you're on a mission critical kind of a, a critical mission, you're going out there and you're trying to do something really, really important and you only have one thing and that thing fails, you're really in bad shape, okay? Really what you wanna have is some type of redundancy. So what I would encourage you to do is consider learning about this plan, adopting whatever you need to do, take whatever you need from it and use this in parallel to whatever else plan you're doing, okay? So background. So how this class originally came on is I was teaching a class called uh, How to Get Down Payment for Nomad. And it was a class basically on how do I come up with the 0% down or 1% down or 3% down or 3.5% down or 5% down to do Nomad. And so we had this whole class, I had this whole outline of doing this, and I began thinking during the presentation, how do I get it so that one person can actually use the previous properties they have in order to fund their down payment in the future? And we came up with this idea of uh, having a tenant buyer come in and agree to lease option the property from you well, the one you're moving out of and giving you an option fee. And you could then use that option fee in order to be the down payment for the next property you're doing that. And so I worked out all the fees and everything by hand. I like sat down, I said, okay, if the tenant buyer gives you $5,000, you could use this to do this. And then I worked it all out and I had this really long sheet to do it. And if, how many of you came to this class? Was anyone who was here at this class? You were there? So there was a class where I basically gave a handout for the first time because I hadn't really worked it out. It was a little printout that looked like that piano looking thing with all the different houses. I'll show it to you here in a second. But I basically I did all that math by hand and I did that. So that was like the, and then at the end of the class, I basically showed this like crazy sp like spreadsheet thing of all the houses and I walked you through the math. So we ended up doing the math by hand, which had become an earlier version of this class. There was an infographic, and there was an error on the infographic. I actually did an error. Like, had a, Well, that's not unusual. Brian's like in the back. He's like, yeah, James has math errors all the time. So I, there was an error on it, though, and I explained exactly how the error worked. The error worked, and it actually ended up being pretty cool. So I'll show you that. And it was originally based on the property in Windsor from 2016. We presented an updated version of this. Um, oh, the updated version is right now for 2019. It's based on a property in Severance or Greeley. And again, you can copy to your account. So I talked to you about that. Previously, I made the following assumptions. So I'm going to walk you through what I originally assumed. And then I'm going to walk you through what my assumptions are tonight. And we're going to do like a little exercise to show you how this all works. Is it getting hot in here? Is it me? It's getting warm in here? I don't know if you want to do AC or what, but. Well, the. You're not allowed? Okay. All right, no worries. So you guys should all have the forms, the rental application, you could use as fans. So uh, modeling assumptions. So there are, so I'm gonna go over one variation of this today, but there's lots of different flavors. There's lots of different things you could do slightly differently. You could use this model and take any excess cash and pay down loans early. You could take the excess cash and do like a creating wealth where you buy more than you need, then you pay them off. You could continue to nomad longer than what we're gonna do tonight. You could nomad for shorter than we're gonna do tonight. There's lots of different ways you can kind of model this. It's not the only way to do it, okay? So first nomad down payment is 1%. The subsequent ones will be 5%. So originally, there was a 1% down loan program. It was actually a really interesting loan program because it was really 3% down, but the lender gave you a 2% grant. That loan program is no longer available. Okay, but at the time when I taught this, it was. And I had clients doing the 1% down program getting a 2% grant. Now, I'll talk about what I'm doing tonight, but I'll hint that we are doing a nothing down loan program, and then we're gonna do 5% down for the additional ones. So if you look at the Financing Nomad 101 class, we have a whole bunch of stuff on that, including creating financing. Uh, rounding up down payment negative cash flow. So when I first did this model, I just rounded up negative cash flow. I said, okay, you know, it's about whatever it was. I rounded up to the nearest whole $50 or $100, I forget which one I did, and I had the numbers rounded like that. 
I've since used exact numbers tonight. Uh, we can do 5% down for owner-occupant loans with conventional financing. That is what we plan on doing. So we're using the 5% down loan program. And the neighborhood we modeled tonight is a USDA approved neighborhood. The USDA loan is a loan that you can do with zero down. There's also, how many people are veterans in here? Raise your hand if you're a veteran. So you also have access to a VA loan probably. Um, and that is a 0% down loan program as well. It does not require you to be in certain areas. The USDA requires you to be in a certain geographic area. Severance is, is included in that area. Okay? Yeah, do microphone. Is there PMI on the USDA loans? I don't know if they do it or not. I really don't. But I, I assume we have PMI when I do my calculations. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, VA loan does not have PMI, but they have a higher funding fee, which is essentially an upfront PMI payment anyway. Okay? You have a question, too? So there's a cap with the VA loans. Can you have VA and USDA loans out at the same time, or is that the same pot? I don't know the answer to that, but I think you can because they're different loan programs. I've okay. never had anyone do it. Okay. But I, you know, check with a lender. The lender will be able to tell you ultimately if you can do that or not. And for the VA, the funding fee, you can wrap into the loan. You correct? can. You can finance okay. the funding fee. Yep. And you can finance the funding fee even for traditional ones if you structure it correctly and you have enough equity. The VA one's really easy to do that. Is there another question? Okay. Do you have a question? Okay. Okay. So, um, so basically the houses I'm doing right now are in a USDA approved neighborhood. So you can do 0% down. There's USDA is a 0% down program. VA is a 0% down program. There's also, I think KeyBank has a 0% down loan and Canvas Credit Union has a 0% down loan. So there's four different choices for you for doing nothing down. It's not like if I'm not a veteran, I can't get one. Okay. There may be income restrictions on this. So if you make too much money, they may tell you no. Okay. All right. Um, and there are also, if you can't do the USDA or the VA or the other two community bank ones, then you can also do 3% down on your first one or two properties. So that would not be the $3,000 program, because the $3,000 program assumes that you are able to do the nothing down one first. So just realize if you need to do 3% down, you would need to actually budget for that, which if you're talking a $350,000 property, it's like 11 grand for down payment or so. Okay? Um, so we're going to do 5% for the rest. There's a whole section on how to get down payment for Nomad class. You can go watch those. Uh, originally, I was disregarding depreciation, which actually can al almost eliminate negative cash flow in our marketplace. So I'll go over some depreciation stuff a little bit later, and I definitely go over it in the book in detail. But depreciation is a tax benefit the government gives you on the value of the property, not the value of the land. And it can help offset negative cash flow by giving you a reduction in your taxes on rental properties only. Uh, several different solutions. We had a multi-pronged approach for addressing negative cash flow. If you have that, how many people have seen my cash flow explosion class? Cash flow explosion. Only if, like three people have seen cash flow explosion? Yeah, Brian's going to teach that one. That's an awesome class. Brian is shaking his head yes. All right, so classes, strategies to get the lowest monthly payment when buying real estate. There's a whole class on that. There's a class on Nomad with lease option exit overview. There's a class on the lease. There's a class on the lease option. There's a cash, cash, flow, uh, cash flow explosion. So those are all classes. Go to the podcast you can listen to most of them. Okay. Uh, my other assumptions, I was assuming tenant buyer bought after four years. So let me walk you through what the tenant buyer situation is, and, and you'll understand what them buying after four years means. So uh, let's pretend for a minute Allison um, decides she's going to be a tenant buyer for me. So I have a property. I'm living in it as a nomad. About uh, nine months or ten months into living there, I start advertising. Uh, rent to own or lease option, tenant buyer wanted. Um, you know, come rent this property for a year or two or three, and then you could buy the property from me at a pre agreed upon price. Allison inquires, she's like, I'm interested in doing that. She has an option fee, which she's going to give me. Um, and then she actually rents the property for a year or two or three while she is either improving her credit or establishing tax returns if she's got a new business or things of that nature. So she needs time in order to qualify for the loan. So I say to her, no problem. Allison, you can go ahead and rent the property from me. You're going to give me an option fee, and then you have to buy it sometime in the next two or three years from me. Okay? So I lived in the property for a year. Then she's actually going to move in after the first year, and she's going to rent it from me for a year or two or three. Her choice, the price goes up every year, and then she ends up buying the property from me. So in this particular case, when I, my assumption was that I lived in the property for a year, and then the tenant buyer bought it after living there for three years. So I lived in it for a year myself, then they bought it after three. Does that make sense to everybody? Does that mean every single time Allison is the one buying the property? 
No, what could happen is um, I go ahead and I put Allison in there for the first year and then she finds the love of her life after the first year and says, I don't want to buy the property anymore. You can keep my option fee. I found Prince Charming. I'm going to move in with him. He's already got a castle and we don't need to actually live here anymore. Thank you very much. Then we go find another tenant buyer. We put that new tenant buyer in there and we start over. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Do you lose the option fee? when that first tenant buyer would leave? That's a really good question. So it is all negotiable, but the way that we encourage people to structure it is the, the, the uh, tenant buyer gives you an option fee as a seller. That does get applied when they buy the property, but if they do not buy the property, they forfeit that, okay? Now you can decide to structure any way you want, but we encourage you to do something like that where it does get credit to them, but if they don't buy, you get to keep it as a forfeit fee, okay? Okay, so... My original assumptions were assuming that the profit did not increase, although it does over time. The longer you do it, the more debt pay down you have, the higher the property value goes up, so the more profit you do have. I was assuming it was $45,000 profit when you did this for four years. And if you think about it, at the time it was like a $300,000 property, and I was using 3% for appreciation, so it was about 9 k per year just in appreciation alone, and then you had debt pay down as well. And so four years times nine is 36, and then he had about $10,000 in debt pay down between all four years as well. That's where that assumption partially came from. Uh, that, include, that included getting the 1% and 5% down payment back. Okay? When we put the 20% down, we were getting 100K profit, which included getting the 20% down payment back. And if you're talking about 20% down payment on about a $300,000 property, that's about 60K of it was from the down payment. Okay. Uh, we were assuming you were waiting for the tenant buyer with the 5% option fee when exiting your nomad homes. This is a really important point. So I'm going to go buy a property as a nomad. I'm going to move into that property. I'm going to live there for a year. I'm going to start advertising to find a tenant buyer like Allison. What happens if I advertise and I don't find somebody? Do I go buy the next property, month 13? No, we wait until we find Allison. What if Allison comes to me and she's like, hey, listen, I don't have 5% to give you, which I need in order to buy the next property. How about we do this lease option deal and I only give you $1,000 instead of $15,000 or whatever it ends up being for $350,000. Is that okay for me? Why not? Because I need the money for the down payment and that's the critical point. So if she comes in and she doesn't have enough in option fee, my answer to her is no, right? I have to wait until I find someone who has an option fee, and that's important. So why do we require the 5% option fee? Just told you. Is it unreasonable to ask for 5%? On a uh, $350,000 house, the option fee is going to be in the ballpark of $18,000. Does that seem really high to ask for an option fee? Someone to give you $18,000 to be able to buy a house from you a year or two or three years in the future? Anyone want to take the alternative side besides seems reasonable? Yeah, microphone. Yes, I'll just take the alternate side because uh, typically those people don't have the down. Otherwise, they'd be buying. Great, thank you for saying that, Tom. So if they don't have the down payment, what do I say to them? You cannot qualify to buy this house. You don't have a down payment. What if they say to you, you know, but I've got great credit. I could go buy a house with nothing down. Great, go do that. <laughs> go buy another house. You know, if you can go, if your credit is really good and you can qualify every other way, go do this nothing down program. There's a USDA program, there's a VA program, there's two like local community banks, Canvas Bank and Key Bank, that also do 0% down. You should go do those. If you don't have the down payment and you still need someone who's going to be creative and flexible with you, I'm not your solution. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Also, it's interesting. If somebody is coming to you to do this lease option, in a lot of cases, not every single case, sometimes it's that they don't have tax returns because they started a new business or they just got in town or something else like that. But in a lot of cases, it's because they've got some type of credit challenge. Either they um, had a credit blemish or they had a bankruptcy or foreclosure or short sale or something like that, and they need time for their credit to improve. Okay? If someone has you know, not amazing credit, what's the loan program we typically have for people that don't have amazing credit? Anyone know? FHA. FHA. 
How much is the down payment amount for an FHA loan? 3.5%. Now realize this 5% that we're asking for is 5% for the value of the house we're buying. It's not 5% of the price that they're gonna buy it for a year or two or three down the road, right? When you kind of add in what the price is gonna be a year or two or three down the road, this 5% might be really, really close to 3.5. And I have a feeling Brian's checking my math. Did you? Just do it, I'm kind of curious what it comes up to be. Okay, Brian's gonna do the math. So is it unreasonable to ask for 5%? No, because that's what they're gonna need in order to buy the house anyway. Are you, are you doing them a disservice if you say to them, sure, give me $5,000 today instead of $18,000, but I know for a fact that you're never gonna be able to save up the rest of the money for your down payment, and I know you're never gonna be able to qualify for a loan. Is that playing fair? You're, you say, yes, that's playing fair? I don't think it's playing fair. What I wanna do is I wanna say to them, I wanna make sure you're gonna have the down payment a year or two or three from now, and I want you to go talk to a lender before I say, yeah, let's go do the lease option. So the lender can say, as long as you do this, you will be qualified in a year or two or three. Okay? You don't want to set someone up for failure. You want to set them up to win. You want them to perform. You want them to buy the house. Does that make sense? Okay. What did the math work out to be? There you go. So it's pretty close. Three and a half is what is needed. Brian says it's four and a half. So it seems in a ballpark. So here it is. FHA is 3.5. What many people credit challenges will get. Some tenant buyers may decide not to buy. That's why we use the four years. So we talked about the example with uh, Allison go ahead and finding Prince Charming and not buying. Do we ever try to like force people not to buy and play hardball to try to get them to not perform? No. We want to encourage them. We want to do everything in our power to get them to perform. But, but they are going to just voluntarily say, life changed for me, I no longer want this house, I got married, I got divorced, we had an extra kid, I don't want the two bedroom anymore, I need a three bedroom. They're gonna come up with their own reasons to not buy the house, okay? Yeah, all right. Let me say it another way. Let's say instead of somebody coming up with this 5% option fee and giving it to us, let's say they did go buy a house. And three years later, they actually decide to sell the property because they no longer want it, okay? Instead of actually being a tenant buyer, renting it for two or three years and then buying it from us, let's say they put up 5% down and then they bought the house, got a loan on it, and now three years later, they're selling it instead of walking away from an option fee. What is the cost to someone to sell a home with a real estate agent in our local marketplace? 6% 6 plus what? Because that's just the commission, right? Plus what? Closing costs, so probably like seven-ish, right? So if they can walk away from five, is that better than them walking away from seven? Right? So you can make an argument that it's actually you end up losing less money if you go and you do a lease option and you end up not buying than if you bought the property, lived there for two or three years and did this, although there is some other benefits like appreciation and debt pay down that they would have if they did that. So there's a really good class. How many people came to the class where I broke it up into two parts one part where I talked about all the different lease option stuff, and then the second half was me presenting what lease options were to your tenant buyers for you. Anyone come to that class? So go watch that class where I explain lease options to tenant buyers. You'll get a lot of good information from that. Okay, so some tenant buyers may decide not to buy. That's why we use the four years. Always do business win-win or not at all. You may end up getting some forfeit deposits, but don't count on it and don't model it that way. So our intention is not to take advantage of option fees where people forfeit them. Will that happen naturally? Yes. Do not model it that way. Don't say, well, if 50% of them fail, I'm doing great. Right? You don't want to include that in your model. We want to help them buy. We don't want to set them up to fail. Okay. So my other assumptions were a tenant buyer was going to put, um, oh, I, so I actually did this. When you were buying the properties, eventually you got to the point where you had enough money where you didn't have to move into properties anymore. You could buy more properties with 20% down. And then we were gonna offer those to tenant buyers, and for those, we modeled it with 3% option fee instead of five, because we didn't need it for the down payment, we were willing to accept 3% instead. Okay, that's also been changed. I rounded up to the nearest 1K. I changed this for our new modeling tonight. We're not modeling option fees on the 20K down, 20% down payment properties, so you'll talk about that later. 
I'm assuming tenant property, tenant buyer properties when putting 20% down have break even cash flow. That was my assumption back then. I think they're slightly negative today. Lenders can change their rules. These rules are based on the current lending re regulations. And if you remember, I talked to you about this because there was a 1% down program originally. That's what this original class was based on. It wasn't based on doing 0% down. Okay? So lender programs can change. All right, so this was the handout I gave to people. I basically printed it out, I went over it, and then I spent like, I don't know, 40 minutes or so walking you through what each number and what each little thing meant. We're not doing that tonight, but I wanted to show it there so that you guys can see what it looked like and how much better tonight's going to be than this. Okay? But you can go look at the old presentation. It's recorded. So if you want to see it. All right, so my new modeling assumptions. So here's what I'm modeling tonight. Originally, based on actual properties I bought that you could buy, could pick less expensive property or pick properties with slightly better rent-to-price ratios, which will improve these numbers. So the properties I'm picking are new construction properties um, in Severance or Greeley right now, and I consider them to be like the top, I don't know, 15%, 10% of the marketplace for possible deals we can get right now. But you could go find properties with better price-to-rent ratios. We have a little bit better cash flow. Probably going to be in Greeley, and they're probably not going to be new construction, so your maintenance is going to be a little bit higher. Okay? But you could do that, and these numbers would improve. Okay? Uh, so I just talked about that. We are not cherry-picking the best deals. And that's what we recommend for Nomad, picked from the top 5 to 10 percent of properties in the marketplace. Okay, that's what we're recommending. Make reasonable concessions if you're living in the property. So if you're doing Nomad, I don't think you should go buy $700,000 properties and pimp the thing out and do that. I think you should buy rentals. But if your spouse says to you, I'm not willing to do this Nomad thing unless I have granite countertops, that seems like a reasonable concession for me paying a little bit extra for granite countertops when you're not going to do it otherwise seems like a reasonable trade-off. Okay? Let's walk through the assumptions we use for tonight. Let's do that. Oops. If you don't like my assumptions, change them and run this for yourself using the Real Estate Financial Planner. So that link I gave you already, if you don't like anything I'm about to tell you, you think, James, that seems hokey. No one's getting this or no one's doing this or whatever it is, go ahead and change them and rerun it and see the difference. Okay, my assumptions. This is a $350,000 property. It's appreciating at 3% per year. Does that seem reasonable? Okay. We're getting $2,000 per month in rent on traditional rentals going up by 3% per year. Does that seem reasonable? You question that? You do question that. So I have a property, this exact property, and that's what I'm getting. Yeah. And actually, Brian tells me I'm low. He says I should go for 2050. Okay. Uh, rents are also going up by 3% per year. There's a small $50 per month premium for lease options. So for lease options, I'm getting the high end of the rent range. Right? If you're giving someone the ability to buy a property from you, you're probably not getting the low end of the rent range. You're probably getting the high end of the rent range. And so we're saying $20.50 per month for the lease option deals in rent. Okay? Down payment interest rates. So owner-occupant nomad properties, the interest rate is 4.375. That's an owner-occupant rate. The first 0% down, first is, the first uh, property is a 0% down, USDA, VA, or other nothing down programs from local lenders. The, uh, all but the first one are 5% down payment loans conventional. The non-owner occupied properties are 20% down, their interest rate is 4.875. You do get hit on interest rate when it is non-owner occupant, when you're not living in the property. You have a higher interest rate for those, even though you're putting more down. Closing costs, they're rolled into the purchase with 5K of seller concessions when you're doing the Nomad properties. And in this case, we're doing new construction, which is how we're able to get this. It is extremely difficult to be able to negotiate a $5,000 seller concession on a regular mom and pop sort of seller in our marketplace right now, especially under 350. So if you think you're going to be able to negotiate this in our market on non-new construction, not likely. It's possible, but not likely. Uh, flat $3,000 for the 20% down payment ones, not rolled in. And part of the additional expense is some PMI stuff up front. Continuing assumptions, there's no HOA. In this case, it's a metro district. I'll, I'll get to you in a second. 1% of the property value is in taxes. So that is in replacement of the HOA. It's a metro district. 
So on, a, on this property, it's a $350,000 property. Instead of the taxes being what they might normally be on a property, which is usually like 0.6, they're now going to be a full 1% or about $3,500 a year in property taxes. Okay? 3% vacancy on traditional 20% down rentals. We're assuming a 0% vacancies on lease options. One of the reasons I'm able to make this assumption is you're waiting until you find your tenant buyer before you move out of your property. And if you have one move out, you have a forfeited option fee in order to account for the vacancy elsewhere. Make sense? 10% maintenance on the traditional 20% down properties, a 5% on the lease options. It's low for two reasons. Number one is these are brand new houses. New construction with a warranty for the first year. So your maintenance the first year should be almost zero. Then you have a brand new property, brand new roof, brand new flooring, brand new kitchen, brand new bathrooms, brand new everything. So the maintenance on those should be less than 10%. As the property ages, your maintenance should go up. But what are we doing with these properties? We're selling them. So the chance of our maintenance really getting out of control is really, really low. The second reason is we're not just renting the properties. We are lease optioning the properties to a tenant buyer. They have buyer mentality. It's their home. They intend to own it and live there and, and buy the property from you. So they should take better care of the property than a typical tenant would, and they should be doing little maintenance things around the property because they have ownership mentality on the property to begin with. Okay? So those are the reasons why I use 5%. Again, don't like my assumptions, change them up. 0.4% of the property value for insurance. Uh, insurance, Brian, is uh, $1,400 per year and a $350,000 property seem reasonable? Okay, so those are my assumptions for insurance. That does increase as the property value goes up. It is self-managed. We're assuming you're hustling to do this and you're not gonna hire a property manager. If you wanna put a property manager fee, do that. You're not gonna be able to do it for $3,000 so. Okay. Uh, no return on the money in savings. I ran this both ways. I ran it with getting a stock market rate of return on any extra money you had in your bank account, but I ended up just taking it out because it didn't make that big of a difference. And so we ended up doing 0% return on any money you have in cash. Okay? But if you think you want to have a 1% savings rate or 2% or you know, 8% or whatever it is, you can do that. All right, and so here it is. I ended up starting with $10,000 in the account, but it never goes below 7K. So that's how you can do it with three. And I just did it with 10K because that's what I ended up doing. Okay? So hence the title, you have to do this whole thing with 3K. The balance never drops below seven, and I will show you a chart of that at the end of the presentation. Uh, the lease option properties sell after owning them for 60 months. So remember my assumptions before were the properties would sell after four years. I bumped it up to five. One of the reasons I bumped it up to five is you're living in it for one, and I figured I would give you a more conservative one out of four chance of your tenant buyer buying the property from you instead of one out of three. So I made it a little bit more conservative. It also actually helps you in a weird sort of way because you end up owning the, owning the property longer. Okay? So you're, if you want to run it with the old version of four, go ahead and change it. You can change that assumption. But I did it tonight with 60 months. Okay? Which means you're going, giving the tenant buyers at least four years to perform most cases and sometimes five. If we bought a property with 20% down and we immediately put a tenant buyer in there, we give them the full five years to do it. If you're, if you're nomading the property, living there for a year, and then you're putting a tenant buyer in there, they have four years to perform. Okay? The seller's share of closing costs at the time of sale are 1%. So when we're selling the property to the tenant buyer, we are agreeing that we're paying 1% of the, of, the, of the closing costs. We're, we're paying 1% of the sale price in closing costs. Now, most of the time, depending on how your lease option agreement is written, the tenant buyer is actually covering this. But I put it in here to be conservative. So I'm assuming you're paying a 1% transaction fee, your, closing, your share of closing costs on the deal. If you don't think that's reasonable, change it. Then long-term capital gains, because when you sell the property, you can't just take all of the proceeds and use that to buy your next property. You need to pay capital gains on any gain you had on the property, the difference between what you bought it for and what you sold it for. Plus, you need to, you need to actually recapture depreciation. And there's a class, it was arguably the best class of the year, the short one where we did depreciation recapture. So Brian actually showed how depreciation recapture is a harsher tax on the poor because you're always taxed at this full 25% rate regardless of your income. But we're using the high 25% depreciation recapture rate, which is the, the default one, uh, for doing depreciation recapture. So any depreciation you were able to get on the property while you rented it out, 
you're going to pay a 25% tax on that when you sell. So it's really going to eat into your profits. And then we're using a 4% safe withdrawal rate as part of calculating when, or when you can actually hit your financial independence number, which I think is actually aggressive. I would not personally use this, but I think a lot of people like to use 4%, which is why I used it. So if you think it's too high, go ahead and change it. Yeah, microphone. So on the depreciation, what if you're doing like a 1030 exchange? How does that work? It's a really interesting question. So if you do a 1031 exchange, you end up paying, I don't know, $800, $1,000, whatever it is the cost for the 1031. You don't actually get rid of your tax liability. All you do is kick it down the road a little bit. And so if you did that, you would need to immediately use that money within the next couple months to buy another property. You need to use all of it or pay you know, the difference in taxes on it. So if you're, if you're in a situation where you sell a property and you have a part of a down payment and you've got to wait for another one to sell next year, you're not going to be able to do a 1031. So if you think about it, you know, I move into my property, I sell it, I end up getting I don't know, $45,000 as part of my down payment to do this. I can't use it for my owner-occupant property because you can't use 1031 money to buy owner-occupant property. So I'm not going to be able to use it for the next one I buy personally. And if I was going to use it to buy a 20% down property, I'd have to have enough to be able to do the full 20% down. And 45K by itself is not enough. You'd have to wait for another one to sell. And so it's probably not practical in all cases to do it. In some really rare cases where you're selling multiple properties really close together, sure, you could totally do that. And then you're just delaying paying those 1031 taxes for a while. So yes and no, but mostly no. What's that? Or you saved other money. Yeah, or you saved other money, which in this case, you're not, you're not doing it, right? I mean, this is a really t like a tight case to do it. You want to give Grace in the mic? Yeah, uh, under the lease option, yep. are rents raised over the years? Uh, 3% per year. Okay, that's just written in the lease option, the agreement that you have with the tenant? Yep, it totally is, and it's modeled in this thing as well. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Sweet. Make sure you guys sugar up with those cookies. I am not taking those home with me. All right, so the effective income, oh, I have to hear this. Household earning is $5,000 per month, but I'm not assuming you're saving anything. When you come to the presentation, how to acquire a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio earning $5,000 a month, that class, I am assuming you're saving money and you're using your savings to save up your down payment and buy stuff. I'm not assuming you're doing lease options in that one. So if you wanna learn, come to the class where we talk about using a, an earnings rate and actually saving up for down payment, that's like a month from now. Tonight's class, we're not doing that at all. We're assuming no savings, okay? You basically are you're earning $5,000 and after tax and everything, you're, you're totally depleting this full $5,000, okay? And this is household income, not per person. So between you and your spouse or significant other, it's 5K, uh, which is, if I'm not mistaken, is like just over minimum wage, okay? So the effective income tax for this state and federal is 23.11, and that is what we are using for the depreciation recapture. Not for depreciation recapture, for depreciation, okay? It is also what we're using when we calculate your target income for retirement. So it'll, it'll include those tax rates and stuff like that there. Uh, so your target monthly income retirement is also the 5K. We are assuming you're trying to get to replace the income you're earning now in retirement. So the model is how quickly can we get to the point where you are replacing the $5,000 you're earning with passive income from rental properties or money from the stuff you've saved elsewhere. Make sense? Okay. So year one. So. Now we're going to do the, uh, the, the participation part of this. I'm going to be looking for volunteers. And volunteers will be handsomely rewarded tonight. I will tell you the first volunteer will be on their feet for the most of the rest of the class. So who would like to volunteer and be the seller, the person who is doing the model? Raise your hands. Nick's, Nick is already up. Come on up, Nick. OK. So Nick is going to be our first person. Would you please stand right here? You're going to be our. Our, our investor. Congratulations. So let's give a hand to Nick. Woo! Do you need any cookies? Do you need any soda? Okay. Does anyone else need cookies or soda? Okay. Year one. So Nick has about $3,000 or so in his account. He wants to buy his first owner-occupant nomad property in month one for $350,000 with nothing down. Does everyone understand what I'm talking about? Is there anyone who is confused? Because if you're confused now, you're going to be really confused in about five minutes. Everyone good? This represents the house that Nick bought. 
It's the house that he's owner occupying. It is a low down payment nomad property. Okay? So Nick has bought this property in month one. He moves into the property. He lives there for at least a year. Why is he living there for a year? Why can't he just move in and then move out the next month and do the next deal? The lender requires that he do this. It's something he's signing at closing. What if he's like, you know, I'll just go do the loan. I'm going to move out in two months. The lender won't know the difference. What about that? Fraud. Jail. That's called loan fraud. Right? That's how you get free housing. <laughs> right? And Brian has an old tenant who went to jail for loan fraud, if I'm not mistaken. Prison. Prison. Okay. So it's not a joke. Do not say, oh, James has got this good model, but I can make it better. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move in. I'm going to move out after three months. I'm going to speed this whole thing up. No, 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 no. Microphone. We don't do prison visits. We do not do prison visits. We do not teach the class in prison either for you. So the lender that I'm working with said that um, it was six months, but 240 preferably on the time to move out. So it really comes down to what you sign at closing. If you sign something that says a year, I don't care what your lender says, because that's what you signed at closing. So ask him for a copy of the paperwork you're going to sign at closing and read it. And that will tell you. And if you're not sure, because you don't feel comfortable reading it, have your attorney read it. It's worth the attorney cons consultation fee to keep you out of prison. And I, I will tell you on my last closing. My last closing, which I sold a lease option in March, the title agent at closing, like, she asks, hey, you know, are you going to, you have no plans to move, are you going to be there for a year? Like, she actually asks, and she's had a closing where they were like, oh, we're going to rent it out and, you know, move to a different house, and she just stopped the closing and would not execute the closing. Yeah. So, it's no joke. Yeah. Don't do it. Okay. Any questions about moving in and living there for a year? So, Nick has moved into the property. He is living there for a year. He put nothing down on this property. Does everyone follow? Month nine or 10, Nick starts going out and putting out marketing to market the property that he is living in to find a tenant buyer. Because he has to find somebody who has 5% down, 5% of the next house price that he's going to do in order to move out and buy the next property. Okay? Now, if he had more money, let's say Nick just happened to have $50,000 in the bank account, he still wants to do this super tight, could he spot the lease option tenant buyer fund the down payments from his own pocket, and then when the lease option tenant buyer actually comes in and gives him the other 5% back, he could just replace the $50,000 that he spent. Could he do something like that? Yeah, yeah he could, and th that would make things easier, right? This is like the, the like, tightest, yeah, rock on. Uh, it would be the tightest uh, kind of way to do it where you're minimizing the amount of money you need, personally need in order to do the deal. Yeah, go ahead. So how does that work with taxes? That kind of, like, I feel like that's kind of intermingling money that shouldn't be mingled? I'm not sure I understand. Does, does it really matter or only if it crosses over tax year, really? I mean, I don't think it matters at all. And income or anything? I don't think it matters at all. Do you have any idea on like what, what the hits might be? Because I'm not, I'm not seeing a problem. Yeah, you. Yeah, but let Brian answer the question. So, I mean, there's a couple things you'd be implying. Are you, are you talking about asset protection and like crossing lines from a asset protection standpoint? So, in this case, like, he buys the first one with his own money. It's in his own name until he moves out. When he moves out, what we teach in asset protection is that he's then going to title it in the name of a trust, which has a beneficiary of an LLC. But for easy purposes, just assume that house is now in an LLC. If he wants to pull money from that LLC, he still owns it. He can take an owner draw. Like, there's no, like if he's like paying his personal bills from that checking account for the LLC, that's bad. But outside of that, shouldn't be a problem at all. Any other questions? Okay, cool. So month nine or 10, he's going to start marketing, start looking for his tenant buyer. You're always going to be looking 60 to 90 days ahead of when you need a new tenant or tenant buyer. You're not waiting till month 13 to start this search. You're starting early and you're trying to find someone and telling them the time frame that you're going to be on. Make sense? Okay. Year two, we're going to find a tenant buyer with an option fee to cover the down payment for the next purchase to lease option your first property. Where is my next volunteer? This is a much shorter standing period of time. Al, you're already out. Come on up here. Okay. So, here's how this works. Al calls Nick. 
Stand right there, please. That'd be great. Al calls Nick and says, hey, I'm interested in that lease option rent to own deal you got. Nick negotiates with him and says, okay, I'm willing to allow you to rent the property for up to three years or four years in the future. This is the price in year one, 3% higher than what it is now. This is the price in year two, 3% higher than that. This is the price in year three, 3% higher than that. And in order to do this, you're going to pay a rent of whatever it is, 20, 50 plus some appreciation. Um, and this mountain year two, it's going to keep going up each year. And you're going to be able to buy the property. It's going to require an option fee of about 5%, whatever it worked out to be, about $18,000, $20,000, whatever it was. And Al says, that sounds good to me. I just started a new job. I'm now doing uh, uh, engineering consulting instead of actually working for a company. And so I need to have two years of tax returns. I've got great income. I've got money saved. But the lender will not loan to me until I have two years of my tax returns to be able to qualify for this new job that I've got because I've now started a business instead of working for someone else. And so now he needs time in order to qualify. He loves the house. He's got kids in that school district. He wants his kids to start going to school there. He doesn't want to rent a property for a year or two or buy another property. He wants to move in now, and this is the house he plans on staying in. Does that make sense? So basically, Al says, here is my 20 grand. Hand it over to him. Nick says, here's the house. There you go. Nick says, here's the house. Now, Nick has his down payment to go buy his next property, this time with 5% down. So he has a 5% down house that he's living in, Al is actually, come on over here, you're going to be separated from yourself. It's right here. So now Al has got the property that he is living in as a tenant buyer. He's got a few years in order to be able to buy it. Nick just moved into his new property. He's living there. He got the fee for his down payment from Al. Does everyone follow? Anyone confused? Okay. So Nick goes, buys a second owner occupant property, Nomad, in month 13 for about 360. That's the price of the property at the time with 5% down using the option fee from Al, the tenant buyer. Year three, Nick's been in the property, the one he's living in now for a year. Al has been in the property for a year as well. Nick is now going to go find another tenant buyer with an option fee to cover the down payment to purchase his next property. Where's my next volunteer? Come on up, please. What's your name? Miguel? Mitchell. Come on up, Mitchell. Okay. So we have a negotiation again between Nick and Mitchell. Mitchell happens to, you can stand right there. It's good. So uh, actually, why don't you slide down reverse because it's going to be easier when we start sliding people down. Okay. So. Mitchell basically comes in. He says, I've got the 5% down. Um, I had a bankruptcy. Sorry, Mitchell. I had a bankruptcy. I need a little bit of time in order for bankruptcy to roll off. But the lender said, you call the lender. The lender says, you look good as long as you keep doing what you're doing. You've recovered. You're paying all your bills on time now. You've now got a good job. You had a little hiccup back then. Who knows whatever happened. But he wants to buy the house. He wants to move in. So Mitchell says, here is my 5% option fee. I want to rent the property from you for a year or two or three or four. Here's my pre-agreed amount price. You give him the money, you give him 5%. He gives you the house. Now you're renting to own in that particular property. And now you go buy with that 5% down the next property with 5%. Does everyone follow? Okay. Okay. So now Nick goes and buys his third owner occupant nomad property in month 25 for about 371 with a 5% down payment that he got from the option fee from Mitchell, the tenant buyer. Year four comes along. We're going to go find another tenant buyer. Where's my next volunteer? Come on up. It's Lance, right? Come on up, Lance. So Lance has got some money. Just slide down. So Lance has got his 5% option fee. They negotiate. Everything looks amazing. So he gives them the money. Nick's got the money. He goes and buys his next property. These guys are all tenant buyers. Al has now been there, what, like two and a half years, like going on three years. He's going to be three years this year. Two, and this is his first year. Everyone make sense? Okay. So Nick goes and buys his fourth owner occupant nomad property in month 37 for about 382 with 5% down using the option fee from Lance. Year five, we're going to go find another tenant buyer. Where's my next volunteer? Come on. All right, so she's got 5%. What's your name again? Jordan. Jordan. Jordan's got 5%. Slide down, everyone, please. Jordan's got 5%. They negotiate a deal where she's going to rent to own the property for up to four years or whatever it is. She's got her 5% down. She gives it to Nick. Nick says, here's the property. You're now renting to own for this property. Oddly enough, Lance decides, I found the love of my life. Screw this house. I don't need it anymore. Right? He's like, I'm done. He forfeits his option fee. And now Nick needs to hustle to find another tenant buyer to replace him. So thank you very much. Every applause for Lance.
Here's your book. Go sit down, please. Okay. Now, where's my, where's my tenant buyer who wants to take over this house? Right here. Yeah, come out. April. Okay, so April comes in. Nick negotiates with her another sweet deal. Nick already got Lance's 5%. Is, is he willing to accept less than 5% from her? No. Maybe he is. He doesn't need it. He got 5%. He's already got it in his hand to buy from Jordan to buy his next house. So this was like forfeited money, right? So he might be willing to go ahead and accept less from April to take over where you were in the process. And he might reset the price. Does this make sense? Everyone follow? Yeah. Okay. So here's the house. You give him money, whatever it was. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's not actually in the model. I just wanted to show you an example of how this can happen. Lance could say, I'm done. I don't need this anymore. I lost my job and I, I married the person I'm going to do. I don't need to move in here anymore. Whatever it is. Okay. So these things can happen. So now April's taking over a spot. She's going to be able to go buy new agreement, not really taking over a spot, but she is going to be buying this house on a lease option from Nick. Nick gives the money, goes and buys a brand new house. He now has another 5% down payment house that he is living in as a nomad. Does everyone follow? Okay. Yeah, here's the microphone. Are these always new homes in this? In this particular model, I picked the brand new house because I can, I can see the numbers and I've owned one of them. I've owned several, but yeah, I own one of them so I could tell you the numbers for it. Doesn't have to be, it could be any house, right? But yeah, I mean, we're using new construction as an example in our marketplace, okay? Yeah, Tom, next question. Um, as you gain more properties, um, you have to have more income to qualify. Absolutely, but we get to use 75% of the income that Al is giving to offset some of the expenses on that mortgage. 75% of the income we're getting from this property is rent to offset part of that, 75, 75. So we only really need to be able to cover a small portion of it. But yes, you do need to be able to cover some of it. And if your rents are high enough, it can cover all of it. In this case, since we're coming in, they only put 0% down on this one, five, five, and five, we're probably gonna have negative cash flow on these properties. Correct. And so we're dealing with that. Yes, yeah, any other questions? So if that person that dropped out, why wouldn't you use that to just accelerate the whole thing and make that a normal rental? You already got your down payment for the you next You can, house. but we need the money in order to be able to buy 20% down properties. Oh, okay. Yep. So you can model that, right? You could say, what happens if this happens and go ahead and model it in the calculator. But for tonight, because I know that you're going to need to have money to be able to have enough to have to put 20% down, we're going to do those. Okay. Yep. Because otherwise you could say, why would I put tenant buyers in any of these, right? Why don't I just rent them? And if you have the down payments, you don't need to do the lease option. Lease option is like an advanced way to accelerate this with very minimal money up front. It's a very aggressive strategy. So Your question. One of the, it's not a question, it's just a comment. So one of the also really cool things about lease option is the option fee is not actually taxed. So like as these are rolling over, the option fee when uh, Al gave the first one to Nick, it's not taxed until he either forfeits and walks away or he actually exercises his option and buys the house which is crazy because it's basically like, hey, he's got $15,000 of tax-free money until Al says, I'm out or I'm, I'm exercising. So there's some really interesting things there. Make sure your CPA knows about it. Do you always stay local or do you go out of state? You have to be able to move in if you're doing Nomad. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you can move. I have a client who's moving all over the place, but he's crazy. <laughs> And I would say that to him. So with the model, this uh, you just said it was negative cash flow. Yes. So you could really get in some heat here if you're not careful. I think that's true. So what would your recommendation be to avoid negative cash flow? In theory, don't buy them this way, right? In theory, have big reserves and have more than enough to put down where you're buying properties with positive cash flow. But if you're either wanting to conserve money and you have a huge reserves and you're okay with the negative cash flow, or this is the only way you're getting it done, then you've got to make that decision, right? But in an ideal world, we have a million dollars backing us, we put nothing down, and we don't care about the $100 a month that it's negative because we got a million dollars backing us, right? Or we put 20% down and it's positive $50 a month and we're golden. Right? Either way you look at that, it's fine, but it's a personal choice. And this is, I will tell you, on the extreme of like the most conservative plan ever and like the most aggressive plan ever, this is on the side of the most aggressive plan ever. 
you're basically coming in with almost no money up front and you're leveraging not, not only just your money, you're leveraging the option fee you're getting in order to put it as a down payment on another property. It is like the most aggressive way you could possibly do this. It's like extreme, but it works. So it comes down to your risk tolerance. Totally risk tolerance. Where you're at in life. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have like a bunch of kids and responsibilities. You may not want to. <laughs> could you be sugar? As risky. Could you sugar me up, please? Drink? Yeah, I, uh, my drink is done. So is the is the negative cash flow? Do you have a dollar amount on that, or is it? Yeah, I, if you want to, you can look at all the numbers. I'll show you like a chart of aggregate. But you could. Dr this is why there's not 130 slides with charts tonight. So uh, you can drill down into anything and look at each individual property. Yeah, price right. Um, each individual property to see what the negative cash flow on each is in the calculator and look at it at any given time over the course of the whole thing. Okay. So you look at that. Yeah. And you know, so the other thing you could do is you can adjust these numbers, right? We're using 2050 for rent, but you could have gotten 2100 maybe, or did something else. And so your assumptions matter a lot here, right? Or maybe you don't pick a property in the metro district where the taxes are 1%. Maybe you go find one that has a normal 0.6% tax rate, and now you've got another $2,000 a year or so that you're not paying in taxes, and that could significantly improve cash flow as well, right? So all these assumptions are variable for you. Cool? Yeah, another question. Um, another question on the new homes. Yep. Uh, they're going to need curtains and yard and all that stuff. Is that This the does include yard value? and blinds. Yard that and price blinds. Does. And it does. Okay. Yep. And AC and refrigerator and uh, garage door opener. Ready it's ready to go. The 350 is not washer and dryer. We do not provide washer and dryers to tents. Okay. Yep. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. So your lease option, are you crediting? these tenant buyers, any of their monthly rent back toward the down payment or the purchase of the house? Absolutely not. Rent is rent. The option fee gets credited toward the purchase though. Just that. Yep. Rent is rent. Right. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, Tom. Microphone. Could you, would you ever uh, construct it with a much higher rent because of what I brought up before? They don't have the downstroke, otherwise they'd be buying. You, you know, charge them 2500 or... You totally could. Philosophically, though, I have a slight problem with that unless I know for another reason that they're going to be able to perform. If they don't have the down payment, I may be setting them up for failure because they don't have enough down payment to buy the house from me. So, yes, you could, in theory, do that, but it would have to be someone that has, like, a really compelling reason to do that where I know they're going to be able to perform. I'd rather not, right? I want to incentivize them to actually buy the house and help them do that. Make sense? Okay. No other questions? Oh, more questions. One more. <laughs> You're going to get your exercise in. You shouldn't have worked out this morning. I believe you might have covered this, but the tenant buyer, okay, is, is their fee limited now because this is something that they're, or they've put the down payment on when it comes time to close? Does it limit some of the, 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 fees involved versus somebody going out and finding a house and having to close within 30 days. Is that, does that help with it or is it still the same? I don't think it helps with fees. It protects them from the market going up more than 3% because we're agreeing to a 3% increase per year in price. But what if the market goes up four or five or six? They end up getting a deal. And Brian will tell you about examples in other classes where tenant buyers have walked into pretty significant amounts of equity because he actually had 3% in his agreement and the property was going up seven, eight or nine percent, whatever they were going per year. Other question. I don't know. They paid two thirty-seven five, and it appraised at two eighty-five. So, and that's them being there for four years. And so you go, oh well, Brian, you're not very smart. You left, you know, fifty k on the table, but I didn't. It was still a home run for me, and that's part of the incentive, right? You're making it a win-win. And so the previous person in that same neighborhood that exercised hers walked into like 20K of equity, which is a huge win for somebody. So, I mean, that's the goal. The goal isn't to take every last penny and just be like, oh, hey, you know, you, you bought your house, but there's no equity. It's, it's to have a win-win. This scenario worked pretty good in an up market. Yep. What happens if the market starts turning? I'm so glad you asked that. That's what the calculator is for. You can go ahead and model what happens if you have negative appreciation or you have a market correction and see how that impacts your whole plan. 
So you definitely should go. If you're going to do this model, you definitely should understand what happens in all different market conditions and what happens if it happens like right away or it happens five years from now or 10 years from now or whatever. But you definitely need to do that, not just for this plan, but for every plan you do. You should understand what the situation is no matter what the market does. And for the tenant buyers that are standing up here in a down market, they can come out significantly ahead of what they would have been if they actually bought a house, right? If you yeah, go back let's to- say Let's say Al's house goes way down. He happens to have bought a house in the neighborhood and the neighborhood ends up sucking. There's oil and natural gas and the property values decline. He says, I'm walking away. I only have this 5% in the deal. I don't have to go and buy it and have it affect my credit. I can just walk away from the 5% I put down, which may be less than what he would net if a decline price and also paying a real estate commission on the way out. Does that make sense? Then who gets stuck with it though? Nick does. But Nick can then say, I'm going to convert it to a regular rental. I'll wait it out until the market recovers 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, and I'm still good. Right? And understanding how all that works, that's why you got to do the models much more sophisticated than just this really simple, I'm walking through a demo in class. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no worries. When it comes to the, let's just say $50,000 which is 20%, let's just say, I mean, as a, as a number, does that come off of the, say, 350 or how does that The work? option fee? Yeah. Yeah, the option fee gets credited. It is basically their down payment. So do you have to come up with that money then? No, you do no. not. You need to document it right when you do the lease option agreement up front and you need to talk to the lender and say, listen, we're about to do a lease option. I want to make sure I got all the paperwork you're going to need when he does the loan two or three years from now. What do you need to see now so that later on we don't run into problems? You need to make sure that's all worked out correctly then. What do they have to see? What do the lenders have to Each see? Each lender's a little bit different, but most okay. of them need to see some type of written document and receipt and paper trail of the check and everything showing it. And that's but all? Talk to your Pretty lender. Much. Don't okay. like... Yeah, the option agreement and all the other stuff. But yeah, don't like, don't rely on me and say, James only said he, he's going to need this. Right. Like I told you, you need to go have Al talk to the lender he's going to use. And you need to get with the lender and say, is Al going to be able to qualify in a year or two? Because I don't want to put him in this house, take $20,000 from him and have him not be able to close. And so is he going to be able to close? And what do you paperwork do you need from us if we're going to go into this agreement so that he's going to be able to do this and use that option fee as part of his down payment? So Nick doesn't have to come up with that money. No, okay. does not. That's what I mean. Not at all. Yep, good question though. Did everyone get cookies? No. No? No. You guys skipped him with the cookies? How is that possible? All right, I'll continue on. Someone get that man some cookies. All right, so now do we do this? Nick, do you buy, you have a property in your hand? So Nick bought the fifth owner occupant nomad property in month 49 for about 394 with 5% down payment that he got from Jordan. Everyone follow. Okay? Year six, the tenant buyer cashes you out on the first property for about 405. Al says, good news, I'm now gonna buy this property. And so Al actually ends up getting a new loan, buying the property from Nick, and closing on it. So Al can go sit down, let's give him a hand. He gets his book, can I have that property back? So now he owns that property, Nick no longer owns this property. Okay, does everyone follow? Nick, Nick ended up profiting on that deal, so he's got some money in his bank account that eventually he might be able to use to buy a 20% down payment property. Does that make sense? Where he doesn't have to move in. Okay? Let's see what happens. So now he's going to go find a tenant buyer to buy the property he's living in. Hold it up, please. The property that he's living in, he wants to find a tenant buyer for that. Does he really need to get the 5% from them, or can he spot it to him because he probably has enough from Al? He probably has enough from Al, but he, he could say, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to keep that in my savings account. I'm going to wait until I find my 5% down, down payment option fee uh, or option fee for my tenant buyer and use that. Where's my next volunteer to buy a house? Raise your hands. Okay, come on. So basically, there's a new negotiation. He's got a 5%. You stand right here for a second. Everyone slide down. So he's got 5% option fee. He's now going to rent the property for one, two, three, four years. There's a pre-agreed upon price. Nick, go ahead and accepts the 5% option fee. Gives him the house. He's now a tenant buyer living in that property. Nick now has money to go out and buy a new property. Did I give you your book? Oh, I have it in my hand. Okay. Do you have a house? No. So then Nick's going to go buy another 5% down house. You'll see. That's coming. 
So he buys his sixth owner-occupant property in month 61 for about 405 using the option fee from the tenant buyer. Does everyone follow so far? Okay, year seven. Another tenant buyer cashes you out to the second nomad property. So Mitchell basically says, I can go get a loan. I'm going to go buy the property. He goes, he gets his new loan. He closes on the property from Nick. Nick gets the cash proceeds from the deal. Mitchell now owns the property. Yeah, the property. Let's give Mitchell a hand. Thank you very much. Take a seat, please. Now, slide down, everybody. Now, Nick is going to go and has proceeds in his account. He can buy his first 20% down payment property as a non-owner occupant and put a tenant buyer in it. So because he has enough money from two sales, he now has enough money to buy a 20% down property. He does not need to move in. He does not need to live there for a year. Does everyone follow? Okay. So Nick goes and buys his property, the Red Hotel one, and he wants to put a tenant or a tenant buyer in there. In this case, he's going to put a tenant buyer. So who's my next volunteer tenant buyer? Go ahead, Mac. Come on up. Okay. So Mac's going to come in. With proceeds from that, you're going to find a tenant buyer with an option fee to cover the down payment for the next... Uh, no, we're not doing that. So basically, you're going to come in here, and Mac has now bought a property of 20% down. Show everyone your red hotel. Red hotels are 20% down. Green ones are low down payment nomads. Does everyone follow? 20% down, he comes in. Does he need to get a 5% option fee for this? No, he could do 3%. He could even convert it to a regular rental. In this case, though, I think he is putting a tenant buyer in there, if I remember my model correctly. So he's putting a tenant buyer in, and Mac's going to go give him some option fee, 3%, 5%, whatever they negotiate. He's going to live in the property, rent it out for a year, two, three, or four, or five. He's got a full five years to be able to buy it in this case. Does everyone follow? Okay. Now, Nick, everyone slide down, please. Nick also needs to have move out of the current property and find a tenant buyer for that. Where's my next volunteer? Wow, the volunteers, once you're volunteered, you're good to go. Come on up. So... So she actually goes, it's Lauren, right? Laura. Yeah. So Laura actually negotiates with Nick. She has 5% an option fee. She goes and says, okay, well, one, two, three, four, five years, four years to be able to do this. Here's the price that's going up. She basically goes into the property. She wants to be a rent-to-own tenant buyer. Nick, she gives her the money to Nick, 5%. There you go. Nick gives her the house. Then Nick has the 5% he needs in order to buy his next property, and he buys his next owner-occupant nomad property there. Everyone follow. Okay. By the seventh owner occupant nomad property in month 73 for about 418 with 5% down, using the option fee from the tenant buyer on the previous property. Here's something interesting, I think. Nick will now live in this property forever. No more moving. So at this point, snapshot in time, Nick has is, Nick is stopped nomading. If he does it more, it will speed up everything because he'll actually be able to sell more properties and use more proceeds to buy 20% down properties faster. For the sake of this particular scenario, I said, let's go ahead and stop in year seven. So at this point, this is his permanent home. That's where he's living. So he's not going to go find a tenant buyer for this one next year. Does everyone follow me? Okay. Let's see what happens though. No more finding tenant buyers or owner-occupant properties. I said that. Year eight. So the tenant buyer cashes you out of your third nomad property. So this was the third one he bought. He's gonna go get a, she's going to go get a loan. She's going to cash him out, pay Nick. She now owns the property. Thank you very much. Applause. Here's your book. Thank you very much. Now Nick has cash in the bank. You guys want to slide down some? Thank you. Nick has cash in the bank. You could buy your second 20% down payment property as a non-owner occupant for about $4.29 and put a tenant buyer in there. Where's my next volunteer? Volunteers, raise your hands. Come on up. Slide down, please. So Nick goes out and puts 20% down to buy a property, does not need to move in at all, does not need to wait for an option fee up front to be able to buy it. He buys the property, then he puts another tenant buyer in the property. Tom is actually going to buy the property. It's a 20% down, it's a red property. So it's 20% down. You have 20% down, right? You're, oh, you have 20% down here. And then these are the 5% down ones remaining. Is everyone going to follow? The rental, actually, I think it's a lease option here, tenant buyer. So Tom is a tenant buyer. Now, did he need to have 5%? He couldn't do three, four, whatever it was, right? Okay. That's the end of the year, because he's not actually moving out of this property. So we're not replacing him in the property he's living in. Nick is. Year nine. 
The tenant buyer cashes you out of your fourth nomad property. So Jordan actually ends up getting a loan. She cashes us out of this property. She buys it. Or maybe she says, you know something? I don't want to live here anymore, but I'm going to close on it and immediately resell it to someone else and make a profit. The property has gone up 7% a year on average. I don't want to live here anymore. We're going to take our equity off the table. I'm going to use that equity to buy my next property. Could she do that? Yeah, totally. So let's give her a hand. She's bought a property. Thank you very much. Now Nick has some additional money. You don't have enough though to buy another 20% down payment property this year. So it turns out that that was not quite enough to do 20% down. So year 10. A tenant buyer cashed you out of your fifth nomad property. Sorry, what's your name again? Peter. Peter where's your name today? Oh, it's Peter? Yeah. So Peter actually goes and gets a loan, moves into the property, lives there, pays Nick off. So Nick has some cash in his property, cash in his pocket, and uh, Peter owns the property. Let's give him applause. Here's your book. Thank you. All right, everyone slide down, please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, where's the microphone? Each time this train goes along, the, the, the next person along is paying a larger 5% That's correct. Than, the, than the first person did. That is correct. So that increase in the amount of the 5% goes into Nick's pocket. That's correct. So that, yeah. that, that, that in, <laughs> increases his... If you uh, to be clear though, the price he's having to pay with his 20% or his 5% is also going up at exactly the same rate. So he needs more money to buy the next property. It's what inflation basically is doing to the properties, property prices and the rents. Okay. Yes, that's true though. Okay. All right, so you buy your third 20% down payment property as a non-owner occupant for about 456 and you put a tenant buyer in there. So where's my next volunteer? No one wants to volunteer anymore. Don't you guys want books? Come on, Grayson, come on up. There you go. So Grayson basically comes in, he's got 3% or so down. Um, Nick goes and buys another 20% down property, he's not moving into it, puts 20% down. Grayson's gonna give him a small rebate of about 3% when he finally moves in, and he's gonna live in the property, he has an option to buy it at some point in the future. Everyone follow. Nick stays in that same property, he's just living happy right now. His spouse says, I'm not moving anymore. Okay, year 11. The tenant buyer cashed out of your sixth nomad property. Thank you very much. So Mac basically, oh, this is, uh, this is not the Nomad property. Where's your Nomad? Okay, so Laura actually um, gets cast out. She gets a loan. She buys the property. She gives the proceeds to Nick. Thank you very much, Laura. Yeah. Let's give her a hand. There you go. Thank you very much. So now Nick basically got some proceeds in his pocket. He could probably go use that and buy some other 20% down properties at some point in the future. You have no more Nomads to sell. Are there anyone holding greenhouses besides Nick? So the only house that's left that was originally a nomad, 5% down, is the one Nick is living in. All of these now are 20% down red hotels. Everyone follow? Okay. Except the one you're living in, which you're not lease optioning, so he's living there. You buy your fourth 20% down payment property as a non-owner occupant for 456, and you put another tenant buyer in there. Where's my next volunteer, Barbie? <laughs> so Nick goes, puts 20% down the property. Barbie says, hey, here's my 3%. I want to do a lease option. She moves into the property. Thank you very much. Would you guys slide down, please? And so Nick, Nick's got now four rentals. They're all ones he put 20% down on, and he's living in a property he did as a nomad. Okay? The tenant buyer cashes you out of your first 20% down lease option property. So Mac, your time is up. He goes and he puts the rest of he needs down, buys his property. He's living there. He pays the proceeds to Nick. Let's give him a hand. Thank you very much. Everyone slide down, please. Okay. You buy your fifth 20% down payment property as non-owner occupant for about 482. So where's my next volunteer? I'd love to volunteer, but I'm in the middle. Oh, come on up. You're fine. They'll make room for you. <laughs> they're, they're looking for an opportunity to make room for you. So uh, Nick goes and puts 20% down. Anita decides she wants to be a lease option tenant buyer. She moves into the property, she puts 3% down or so, and she's now got an option to buy this property from Nick. Okay. Year 12. There are no more 5% down payment lease options. They're all done. You buy your six 20% down payment property as a non-owner occupant just from having cash flow on these properties. You end up being able to buy another one. Where's my next volunteer? Uh, Tom, you already did it, right? Uh, you, know, you didn't, come on up. Different Tom. 
Yeah. Awesome. So you're going to put 20% down? Everyone slide down, please. Put 20% down. Does lease option? Oh, oh, no. I'm sorry. You're not lease optioning. You're just a straight tenant. Okay. okay? You're like, screw this. I don't want to buy property. It's really expensive. It's $497. I just want to rent. So you decide just to rent the property. Nick has decided to become just a straight up landlord at this point. These guys all have options. Tom, number two, is renting. Okay? Everyone follow. Anyone confused? No more new tenant buyers. The tenant buyer cashes you out of your second 20% down lease option property. Tom goes and gets a loan, buys the properties. Give a hand for him. There's your book. Thank you very much. So now Nick has more money in his pocket. Nothing else happened in year 12. Does not have enough to buy the next 20% down from that. Year 13, there's no buying and selling. We don't have enough money to do any 20% down at that point. We just keep renting. No one's cashing us out. No one's actually, um, no one, we don't have enough money for any new loans. Year 14, you buy your seventh 20% down property. Where's my next volunteer? Tom, uh, Brian, come on. Slide down, please, everybody. So uh, Nick goes and puts 20% down. Brian Armstrong becomes a renter, not a lease option tenant buyer. He's just renting. So we've got two renters, three lease option tenant buyers right now. Still no more new tenant buyers. Tenant buyer cash you out of your third 20% down lease option property. Grayson decides to go get a loan and buy the property. Let's give him a hand. There's your book. Thank you very much. Everyone slide down, please. So now Nick's got more money in his pocket. Whoa. No, I slipped. No, I, I slipped. That's why I was saying, well. No. You pushed me into this, and I'm sorry, but. He's putting 20% down, but what are the, what are those three? No, this those could are, be those anything they negotiate. Rich. She could have put down $1,000, or it could have been uh, 3%, or it could have been 5%, it could have been 10%. It's negotiable, but he was not relying on it in order to do the deal. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, so we're, in, we're buying eight, is that where we are? Okay, so who's my next volunteer? Oh, Ryan was? Oh. Okay. Well, I just wanted to make clear when you're saying they're cashing out, where's that all going? Is that going in his like retirement funding or? Nope, it's going into a just straight up bank account that's getting 0% interest. Just straight up bank account. That blank, gets first taxed? Bank. It, we're already taking out tax, so the proceeds after taxes just goes in there and sits there. It's, a, it's an after-tax dollar amount because we've already taken out capital gains tax, which is your tax for having sold the property, and depreciation recapture tax. We've already done all that on the property. So this is net after all the things are done. And that I'm goes into a savings account. In a bank account. In a bank account, yep. Why at 0%? I thought I mentioned this, but I just, I ran it at uh, getting a stock market rate of turn. I ran it at zero. It didn't make that big of a difference. So rather than deal with an objection from Brian at, that it's not realistic to get 9% in the stock market, I just use zero. Yeah. It's, it's marginal because he's, he's, he's yeah. using the money. The money's just in the bank account until he can buy the next property. And then he's trying yeah, and you'll see that. It's, oh, so it's, he needs it lucrative. Yes. He needs it lucrative. Yeah. Um, all right, I moved back to try to see where we were. Seven. I probably should tell people numbers next time I do this. Um, so did we do eighth? We didn't do eight, right? So someone who, where's my next volunteer? Hope I'm not off by one. We'll find out. Where's, no volunteers? What's going on, please? No buyers. Alex. It's Alex, right? Yeah. Alex. All right, so Nick puts 20% down. He buys another rental property. Alex decides she wants to become a tenant. She moves in. And just out of, you know, we could say Brian only stays there for a year and we have to get a new tenant. You guys get that, right? I'm just letting them stay here because I don't want to do volunteers and go through everyone in the room. But Brian basically could be one of four tenants that stays in this property over the next four years. You're just taking me. You're just taking me. Cool. Okay. Uh, still, still no more new tenant buyers. That's a mouthful. Year 15, tenant buyer cashed you out of your fourth 20% down lease option property. Barbie goes and gets a loan, pays off Nick. Let's give her a hand. She gets a book. Thank you very much. Everyone slide down, please. You buy your ninth 20% down payment property as a non-owner occupant for about 542, and you keep it as a long-term rental. Who's my next volunteer? 
We're getting down to the end. If you want a book, this is your chance to volunteer. Raise your hands. Oh, come on up. So Nick goes and puts 20% down, buys another rental property, and Greg decides to be a renter in there. Still no more, what's that? Mow your yard. Mow your yard. Still no more uh, new tenant buyers. You're 16, the tenant buyer cashed you out of your fifth 20% down payment lease option property. So Anita decides to go get a loan. She now owns the property. Let's give her a hand. Proceeds go to Nick. Thank you very much, you can go sit down. This is the last lease option property you sell in this model. Were you the renter? Yes. Okay, good. So everybody's a renter at this point. He's got four rental properties straight up now, and he started with $3,000 by year 16 with no savings. No savings rate, like zero starting and saving, or 3,000 starting savings, but no saving per month from stuff. And they were negative cash flow to begin with. Okay? And these are all 20% down properties he had to do, and they're like, almost $500,000 properties, I think. So you keep the remaining properties as long-term rentals. You buy your 10th and 11th 20% down payment properties as non-owner occupant for about $558 each, and you keep them as long-term rentals. I need two more volunteers. Two more volunteers. So Don is, Don is a tenant and one of them. Please slide down. Who is it? Come on up. Is it Doug? Yeah, Doug? Doug, thanks Doug. So Doug is actually gonna be our another tenant here. So now he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, 20% down rental properties that he's got as long-term rentals. Year 17, 18, 19, there's no buying or selling. He doesn't have any more down payment to do anything, so you just keep renting during that time. In year 20, you buy your 12th 20% down rental property. Where's my next volunteer? We're getting to the end, so this is like almost like last call, as they say at the bar. Last call. Do you guys get a copy of the book? Oh, come on up, Bob. Oh, there we go. All right, so hopefully I'll have enough for two. Otherwise, I'll just give you books. So Bob is going to be a tenant in one of these. Everyone slide down, please. No, come on. Come on up here, Grace. You're good, too. We're going to hit you soon. You're going to be the next one. Just stand on deck. Yeah, stand on deck. All right, so you buy your 12th 20% down property as non-owner occupant. Whoa. Here, whatever. All right, you buy your 12th 20% down payment price, non-owner occupant for about 621, keep it as long-term rental. Year 21 and 22, there's no buying or selling, you keep renting. Year 23, you buy your 13th and you keep it as a long-term rental. Come on up, Grace. You slide all the way down there, thank you. Okay. Year 24, no buying or selling, you keep renting. Years 25 and 26, you buy your 14th and 15th respectively. Um, and they're for 7-11 and 7.47 each. So I need two more volunteers. These literally are the last two. <laughs> Where are my last two? Okay. You guys haven't, and you haven't gotten a book, right? One of you two? You should come up and get a book. I don't care who it is. So where do you get your money from to buy these now if you're not? Counting? You're getting cash flow from the properties. From the, your cash yeah. flow? Yeah, I mean now you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rental properties that are all cash flowing. Come on, everyone slide down a little bit. Thanks, Jerry. This is your property. Oh, Michelle. I love okay. Oops. Okay. And so this is the ending position. So this is where I stop you buying or selling any properties. But you went from three thousand dollars, and you you no manage your way to have enough down payment to be able to buy one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 20% down payment properties, all cash flowing. Okay? And he's living in the same property at this point. Okay? Now, there's lots of variations we could have done, right? He could have started taking money and started paying down the properties to increase, improve cash flow. He could have bought 20, sold off half, and then paid off the remaining ones to really improve cash flow. He could have bought fewer and stopped and said, I'm good with whatever it is I'm going to do. I'm just going to wait for things to catch up. So there's all sorts of variations. He could have done more nomads instead of the six or seven that he did and kept doing that till 10 or whatever it was. I will tell you in the class I did originally, the one that from before, I think I went to 13 years with the person nomading. And then I think I made sure they had 20 properties at the end. It was crazy. 
I thought this was more realistic and I didn't want all 20 people standing up in front of the classroom. Okay? So, yes. I go back to pre-recession uh, banking rules. Yep. But it seemed to me that, you know, you get to a certain number of uh, loans and no matter who you borrowed from, the banks would say, you got enough. Sure. You can't with, get any more. With Nomad, there is no limit. If you're owner occupying, you're moving in because it's an owner occupant loan, there is no limit on the number you can get as long as you qualify. Okay, so you have to have enough income to qualify for those things, but there's no like 10 loan limit for that. For the regular traditional 20% down ones, non-owner occupant, there is a 10 loan limit per social security number. So if Nick and his spouse decide to go buy properties, five of you could be on one social security number, five of you could be on the other, and then he could still do five on each more, or you could do portfolio loans to get the rest as well. So those are the 10 per social security number is for conventional financing. You could go to First Bank or whatever it is and get like a you know, portfolio. It's gonna be an adjustable rate mortgage where it's only gonna be fixed for three, five or seven years, but you could do that as well. But stopping at 10, really, really reasonable. If you wanna do more than 10 at this point, nomading actually would make a lot of sense because he's not limited then, he can get 30 year fixed rate financing for that. Okay, so thank you all. Let's give everyone an applause. Uh, stay where you are. I will trade you a book for um, the Monopoly piece, and then you can go sit down. Oh, you need to go sit down too. You're done. <laughs> you do not live there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope I have books for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. No, I got, I got more in the car. In the car, I got more. No, I got more in the car. I'll you already have one? <laughs> Lucky me. Um, go ask Allison to get it from my car. Uh, go, go talk to Allison. Did you go get it from my car? Or do I need two? I think we need two. You want another one? Third, we need three. They're in my pocket. Yeah, I'll give you this. Okay, there's going to be some charts and then we'll end up here. It's going to be perfect timing. Leave the mic in with somebody. Okay. Class. Settle down, settle down, settle down. It's not over yet, there's more. Okay, so I limited, yes, exactly, right? I limited you guys to like, I don't know, eight charts or something like that because I really didn't want to do 130 charts like I do. That presentation is already done. So if you want to see the 130 charts, read the book, go watch the recording of the previous class video because they're all done and in there. This is a different version of the same class. Different assumptions, different numbers. So this is the number of properties the net number of properties you own after you've subtracted out the ones you've bought and sold. So you start off with the one. This is the one he moved into and lived in. You bought another one, moved in and lived there. 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 Then there was a sale. We moved in and lived there again. Another one, maybe it's 20%. Sold one. Bought another one, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. And he's selling some here. So sometimes when he's selling two, he's only got one here. So basically, he gets up to the point where he has 11 properties. Remember the 10 rentals and the one he was living in, and then he stays there for the rest of the time. Everyone follow? Yes, did everyone get a book Okay, I'll let you guys work out the whole book thing. Oops, whoa. Okay. This chart shows something, I can't read it. Uh, total property values. So this just shows you the aggregate value of your entire real estate portfolio, not your equity, the value of all the properties, okay? So it shows you starting off here with like a $350,000 property, then it probably goes up to 700 and small change, you know, whatever the plus 350 is, plus 350. And you can see over time as you buy and sell properties till you get to the point where you have like, I don't know, $7 million in, uh, in inflated dollars, because these are dollars in the future. And then it kind of continues up till eventually you've got like, I don't know, 20 something million dollars in inflated dollars in real estate, not necessarily equity because you still probably have some loans on some of those. Was there a question? So at the end of that, at the end of that demonstration, the first buyer of the 20% down house, the first renter was about $500,000 is what he paid for the house. Yeah, that sounds about right. And the last one was about 775. Yeah, that sounds about right. So then we were $15 million in property total. Uh, it, probably, I, mean, it, I think it's, it's more than that. that. It's more than that. Yeah, because it actually goes over 20. In 25 years. Yeah, at the end of the time, at the end of the whole period, the properties are then worth over 20 million. Now this is in inflated dollars. In today's dollars, what are they worth? A little math exercise for you. 
It's, it's super easy. What were they worth when we started? 350. Yeah, so they're worth 350 each. Yeah. So he has 3.5 million dollars in no, it's no. in today's dollars because basically real estate is just keeping pace with inflation. So if we adjust back for inflation, he has 10 $350,000 properties in today's dollars. So he has like $3.5 million in real estate adjusted back for inflation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So he has like 3.5 million in rentals and another $350,000 house he's living in. So this is really inflation, inflated dollars. The inflation adjusted number is 3.5 million plus 350, whatever that is. Three, almost four. Okay. A million dollars. Yeah, for starting with three grand. Yep. All right, net worth. So this is your net worth. This is uh, after you subtract out the mortgages from the property values and whatever money you had in the bank account. Because once you stop buying properties, your bank account is just growing. And I'll show you that. So you've got a whole bunch of money in the bank and you've got, this, you've got some equity in properties. So your total net worth in inflated dollars is like 335 million. If you adjust for inflation, this is the net worth number adjusted for inflation. You've got six almost six million dollars between cash and equity in the properties at the end of 60 years in the future that's what this number is 720 60 years in the future from owning from getting to the point where you have 10 20 percent down rental properties with this model inflation adjusted so that's like today's dollars value where else can you put in three thousand dollars today put in some hustle this is not like a passive, I don't do anything sort of work. You saw it was effort. It was effort for me to run back and forth and give away books and pieces. Can you imagine what it is when you got to take like 100 tenant buyer calls, right? So a lot of effort to do this, but this is a way to do it. Very, very aggressive too. You know, the scale of like conservative model to very aggressive model, this is like the extreme of for aggressive, okay? Total cash flow. So this is what we were talking about. You had negative cash flow in the beginning. Negative cash flow for a long time, 200 months. Because you were buying new properties and every time you bought one, they had negative cash flow. So all these were negative until finally you got to this point where you were starting to see some positives and eventually you start paying off some loans and the positive cash flow significantly increases over time. And I think this is inflation adjusted. So at this point right here, what month 360 or so, 30 years in the future, he's getting about $2,500 a month in today's value in cash flow per month, net, after all expenses, after all the mortgages, taxes, insurance, maintenance, all that stuff. Everyone follow? Okay. What was that? That's what it took to do that. Yep. We're starting with three grand and not putting any more in. All right. Uh, goal. So this red dash line shows you when you achieve your target monthly income from your investments passively either cash flow from your rentals or a 4% safe withdrawal rate from any money you have in your bank account. Those two added together leads up to be $5,000 per month inflation adjusted. So $5,000 in today's dollars, whatever that ends up being in the future, this is when you hit that goal. And it's like month 400 or so. That's how long it takes you in order to get to the point where you reach the goal of surpassing a $5,000 a month passive income goal, starting with just $3,000 and not saving any more money. Okay? Now, there are ways to speed this up. If you remember the fire class, we talked about lots of ways. Yeah, right. Lots of ways. Winning. Winning. <laughs> we talked about lots of ways to speed this up and move this so that it happens sooner. One of the ways is what Brian's teaching next week, where you buy more properties than you need then you sell off some of them, use those to pay off the other ones, and you get to financial independence earlier. The other interesting thing about this is we way overshot his goal. It took this long to get to 5,000 a month, but he doesn't take very long to get to 10,000 a month or to get to $15,000 a month, and then finally he's at $20,000 a month in, in standard of living. So his standard of living is significantly increasing over time. 60 years in the future, whatever that is. Yeah. Now, we, we can model this lots of different ways where he stops earlier and kind of lets it float in. You could actually do some other things where you take the cash he has elsewhere and do stuff with it. So there's lots of ways to speed this up and optimize. This just is one way to run it. Okay? Any questions on this? Yeah. Microphone. 
This method is extremely aggressive and not very safe at all. Okay. Right? Like of the, of the extremes of all the classes we teach, Brian, why are you giving the look? Is it not that aggressive? Okay, Brian doesn't think it's that safe. I, I, in my, the way I think about it is, of all the different plans you can do, doing this one where you're relying on an option fee in order to buy your next property and you have no cash reserves, presumably, is pretty aggressive and pretty not conservative. If you have, have $100,000 in the bank and you're doing this method and you're using the option fees, I think that's super conservative. But if you're starting with zero and that's your last $3,000, man, that makes me nervous. So that's what I'll say. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So with this model, you got to have a job for 30 years. No, you only need a job until you qualify for your last loan. Um, yeah, I don't know, whenever that was. You're 20, whatever it was on the thing. Yeah. But, you know, you actually have some cash in the bank, so you may be able to start withdrawing from that, knowing that your passive income for your rentals is going, to serve, is going to replace it, so you might not need the cash. Let's take a look at that. So here's your total debt to net worth. This is one measure of risk, Anita. This is one way we measure risk, and it is a ratio of your debt to what your net worth is. And in this case, your net worth is really, really low, which is why it's so crazy high at the beginning, because you basically bought a property with nothing down. So it's your highest risk when you buy that first property. When you buy your next property, your risk was lower and it bounces it back up because you bought on another property and had a new risk. So it keeps bouncing it there. Eventually you get to the point where you have a lot of equity, you have a lot of cash, and the, uh, taking on additional properties is less risky. And so over time your risk gets much lower, but early on this is highly risky. If you look at this even compared to just traditional Nomad where you're putting 5% down, that's not nearly as high as this, okay? Here's the account balance. So this shows you your bank account balance. It kind of hovers near the bottom as you're using your down payments. But eventually you get to the point where you're not buying anymore and it just grows. And this is probably, I don't know, a million dollars or so at this inflection point. Here is 2.5 million and then it just keeps going up and up and up. So you probably could get to the point, this is where you stop acquiring. You kind of answer your question, Lance. So this is where you stop acquiring. You could start just living off of some of this money not do your work knowing that you don't really need to have a ton saved because eventually your mortgages are going to get paid down, your rents are going to take over, and you're going to actually get your income from there. So you don't need this big cash buffer anymore. Does that make sense? So this is a zoom in early on. Now remember I told you you started with 10K, but it doesn't go below seven, which is why I say you can do it with three. So you can see that it doesn't ever go below the seven amount. This is like 10K to start with. You can see there's some dips, but it never goes there. This is like probably a nine or so. And this is when you're saving up money, you sell something, you kind of buy some stuff, you sell something, or you sell, I'm sorry, you buy something, you buy something, you sell something, you buy something, and you can see the jagged eggs. This is the first 10 years. This is the first 20, including going all the way back there. I'm just showing you as I zoom out more and more, but a lot of jagged things go in there. And then this is the full 30 years. And then it kind of takes off and grows from there, okay? This is all of your returns on your equity, uh, including cash flow from depreciation. So you start off with about 125% plus return on equity, or return on investment when you're first buying it, but return on equity. And then as you buy new properties, it kind of spikes up and does this, but eventually tapers out, and all that you're left with is appreciation and cash flow once you get rid of all your debt pay down and your depreciation. There's a whole class, a two hour class on this, I'm not explaining it in detail tonight, but this shows you the chart, so when you go watch that class and you come back to this, you can actually see the details of this. Okay? Any questions? Okay, if not, what is killing your dreams? So what's not believable about this? What will be hard for you? What's gonna prevent you from acting? What's your alternative if you don't do this? Remember the Navy SEALs, two is one, one is none. So what's hard, the down payment? Finding properties, qualifying for properties, getting rents, the worker effort, moving each year, speed of model, market correction, fear, something else. So what is preventing you from doing this model? So I wanna make sure that you leave here having all of your questions answered. So I'll stay until you guys feel comfortable with whatever you need here, but you should have all the information you need at this point. What's the problem? I feel like I'm, I shouldn't say this on mic. <laughs> uh, finding tenant buyers. Okay, so finding tenant buyers, you think that they're rare? Not rare, but I mean, we need a, a strategy to find them. 
Great, I've got a whole class where I teach you how to do tenant buyers. And in fact, more so than even just the class, I recorded an hour long video that you can use to market to your own tenant buyers, where I explain rent to own and lease options to them. So all you have to do is market and use that. Are you finding them fewer in the market that we're in today? No. Nope. I am finding a, a, an ample number of people that have had credit challenges, um, bankruptcies, foreclosures, short sales, some type of medical emergency, someone who started a new business and needs time on their tax returns. All of these things are normally occurring type things in the marketplace. So um, go look at like bankruptcy filings, go look at foreclosures, probably not a lot of foreclosures, but short sales, go look at some of those, go look at all the things like people starting new businesses, you find people. The harder part is finding someone with 5%, but that's a sifting and sorting process and you're giving yourself 90 days to do it. So whenever we put up ads, we get calls. And then you're getting on the phone and answering questions about the process and how it works. It's more work than it is not finding them. Later in time, later Wait, time microphone. Too, also... Later in time down that process, years later, you don't have to be as What else? Yeah, microphone. And that? What about financing? What's that? Financing. Qualifying for financing? Yeah. You gotta be able to buy an owner-occupant loan right away. Now you've got a year to figure out the financing for the next one. You got a year to figure out the financing for the next one. So you've got like four or five years before you need to figure out anything more than just being able to buy a home to live in. And if you can only afford a $150,000 property in Greeley to start off with, then that's where you start. You don't start with a 350 if you can't afford a 350. So go do something. Go buy a condo in Greeley or half a duplex or something like that. Just get started so that you can start getting your tenant buyer and then ramp up and do the next one, do the next one, do the next one until you get to the point where you're doing the properties that you want. Because you're not going to keep them long term anyway. Right? So if you have to start with a less expensive one to get started, then so be it. Any other questions? Would you have rather seen 130 charts? <laughs> Brian actually wants to see 130 charts. Yeah. This means no. No, huh? <laughs> all right, well, if you don't have any other questions, please stick around for the class after the class. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next week for Creating Wealth.